for some people, a midlife crisis is a great opportunity. That was something I experienced too. Okay, I'm in my early 30s. I'm where I thought I wanted to be. This is kind of disappointing. <laughs> I realized like late dreamers are a whole category of talent. Obviously, at that point, my clients were like, what are you talking about? We're not going <laughs> to hire a 60-year-old novelist. All we're doing is taking what the market is saying for our own reality. I haven't made it. It's not going to happen. That's not just an analysis of where you are. That's creating a situation. Torrent is made of drops and you've got to keep going. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Henry Oliver. He is uh, finalizing a book that is going to come out in the spring in the UK and in the fall in the US called The Second Act, which I'm really excited about. It's exploring the lives of late bloomers, people who got their start on their thing later in life. I'm not sure if I qualify as a late bloomer. I sort of found my thing writing in my 30s. We'll see what Henry thinks about that and if I qualify. But excited to explore his path, his curiosity, and some of the ideas he's uh, shared in this book today, among other things. Welcome to the podcast, Henry. Hi, thrilled to be here. Fantastic. So the question I always start with, I gave you a preview of this earlier, uh, what are some of the stories and scripts that sort of shaped you growing up that told you about this is what you're supposed to do when you grow up? I think I was fortunate that I did not have a lot of pressure from my parents in that way. So there was a general, you know, it's good to be a lawyer. It's good to be like whatever. That general kind of idea was there, but there was no overt pressure. And there was very little of that kind of like, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, and so I just followed my nose all the time, really. And I was very, very fortunate because I had teachers who were, uh, I don't know if they'd appreciate this, but they were like real nerds, right? They were still really into their subjects and they still really just followed their own curiosity. So uh, I, I just sort of made my own way through. I didn't feel like I was given too much pressure. But I was surrounded by people who believed they had to be doctors or dentists or accountants in order to, you know, in order for everything to be okay. How did you not get sucked up in that? Just your parents? Uh, <laughs> my parents were very good. I think my mother would tell you that, like, there would be no point. Uh, you know, he was a stubborn child. What am I going to do? <laughs> I think is the... <laughs> uh, but yeah, they were very good about it. They didn't. What did they do? Uh, they were both lawyers. And, uh... As I say, there was definitely a sense that that was like a good thing and you, you, know, you needed a secure job. And they, they sort of talked about it, but um, they, I think they could see I was very interested in other things. And so they were, they were pretty relaxed about it. That's pretty cool. And tell me about some of the people, uh, the nerds you were learning from. It, it's interesting you say that. It makes me think of this uh, Bertrand Russell reflection where he talks about everyone thought he was foolish until he arrived at Oxford and people were like, oh, philosophy is actually okay. Yeah. While getting mocked his entire life before that. Yeah. Um, I had teachers who were still, so these people, they're teaching philosophy, literature, uh, biology, subjects like that. They were still reading widely. They were still trying to explore new ideas, right? They were still trying to push themselves, um, you know, to, to read in areas of philosophy they hadn't read before. They were always ready to have a conversation about what, what about this book, what about this thinker, but have you considered this? Like, always ready to challenge or to be challenged about ideas. And so you just got this great sense of, like, that's just what you do, right? Uh, political philosophy, like all, all sorts of subjects like that. Um, and, and so there was... There was much less for me of the sense that like you do these things and you pass this exam and that's that's that and much more a sense that like okay we have to do the exam that's a real thing whatever but it's amazing we're studying john stuart mill plato shakespeare this is amazing let's really get into this let's talk about the other things that they've done like who wouldn't want to do that and so just going way beyond the exciting thing that's beautiful uh yeah. any of these 
teachers stand out particularly? You want me to name people? No, I just mean, were there specific instances or, um, like, were there comments? I mean, to me, that does sound wonderful looking yeah. back now, but I didn't have anything close to that. Like, <laughs> I was so lucky. I was so lucky. And it was, there were, there were like three or four of them. And it was all at the same time uh, when I was like 16, 17, 18. So it was, I was very, very fortunate. And it wow. wasn't so much specific incidents as just like, that was just the way it was. That was just That's the so cool. Yeah, it was really. I say three or four. There, there were more. It was really, it was really, really good. So you, you, I've, I've read some of your stuff you've written about John Stuart Mill. You brought him up, so I'm going to use yeah. that as an opportunity to dive right into this. Um, maybe tell us a bit about John Stuart Mill. I, I find his story fascinating yeah. because. I mean, when I when I started reading his autobiography, I was sort of blown away. It's like, Dude. wow, this young person <laughs> knows so much more than what I did, and it sort of broke my brain of what um, is possible. So, yes. yeah, I'd love to hear if he inspired you, if at all. I read Mill as a teenager, studied on liberty for an exam, and I, you know, fell in love with with him. I read. The biography uh and have subsequently just carried on reading him carried on being interested in him i think i've read all of the biographies of him uh, i've read i haven't read all like his complete works it's huge but i've read a good chunk i'm not like raised the video to me he's one of those writers there are a few people in english literature who can just they can just do anything right and mill he's an economist he writes a textbook of logic. He's a political philosopher. He knows a huge amount about French affairs and French literature and becomes the leading comment on French affairs in England at the time. He knows a lot about the ancient world. So he can review very authoritative, like histories of Rome, right? Histories of Greece. And he, he keeps in his mind for his whole life this like idealized vision of Plato and and this really, I think, informs a lot of the the idea of like accomplishment, as you say, like really expanding what you think it is possible for someone to know. He is drawing that the expression. Um, and none of that is his day job. Like that's what's <laughs> so remarkable about Mill. Uh, so there are a handful of these writers that you can just keep going back to uh, more and more in uh, every time. Yeah, and so were these sort of your role models as you were coming of age? I don't think I thought of it. But yes, in someone like Samuel Johnson, well, the, they're the people that I'm, you know, particularly admired. Yeah. What stands out about Samuel Johnson? I could talk all day about Samuel Johnson, so you have to cut let's, me off. Let's go. Um, this is a this is a nerdy podcast with a nerdy crowd. So, so <laughs> Samuel Johnson, uh, he wrote the dictionary. One man wrote the whole dictionary himself. It took him nine years. That is just on the numbers. That is a ridiculous. It, that it's like it's difficult actually. <laughs> that to is comprehend. crazy. <laughs> yeah, and we're talking like forty-two thousand words in the dictionary. So that's quite wow. difficult to comprehend how he did that. There are um, his his innovation in this dictionary was definitions. So when we use a dictionary, it breaks down. These are all the different things this word means, right? And for some words, that might be dozens of separate meanings. Johnson invented that. Before Johnson, dictionaries were more like the sauruses. They just said, you know, here's a word that means the same. Wow. And, they would, and for that reason, they would often concentrate on like slightly obscure words. Johnson was like, no, I'm going to define get, right? A word which I believe has two and a half thousand word entry in his dictionary. And the, the other thing he did that was remarkable, he gave quotations for all of these definitions, drawn from the poets, the scientific writers, the historians, like whatever the, the appropriate source was. And so it's an accomplishment both of writing. I mean, how did he, how did he do that? But, you know, but also of reading. He read so many things. There are 115,000 quotations in his wow. dictionary. 
And so people used to read his dictionary at just like almost like it was a text, right? It would it would be an education in itself to study this diction. Um, now, so this is like difficult to understand how he did this level of, of accomplishment, and the definitions have real elegance to them. He didn't he didn't just sort of knock out you know boring stuff. They're still quoted because some of them are witty, uh, and they were, uh, I think, seventeen hundred of them when they came to write the Oxford English Dictionary sort of 150 years later, something like that. I think 1,700 of their definitions, they just took straight out of his dictionary because those were, you know, still like, actually, we can't do better than that definition. Um, I just pulled up, uh, I just pulled up his online dictionary, Johnson's yeah. Dictionary Online. Great, so great I, I, I picked random words. So to bring this alive, color... Spelt in the British way, of course. Uh, the appearance of bodies to the eye only. And uh, hue, dye. It is a vulgar idea of the colors of solid bodies. When we perceive them to be a red or blue or green tincture of the surface. But a philosophical idea. When we consider the various colors to be different sensations excited in us by the refracted rays of light reflected on our eyes in a different manner according to the different sizes or shape or situation of the particles of which surfaces are composed. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And that's Watts. Yeah, he's just quoting people. Yeah. So he, he not only knows how to give you all the specific definitions, he knows where to find the right quotation that will show you it in use. So for that to come out of one mind, it's, it's, it's quite something. He then... Wow. There's um, seven, 17 quotes here for the for exactly, color. Exactly. <laughs> this is wild. How did he this do it? This is such a good, this is such a good rabbit hole. Right? Um, oh, that, that... <laughs> now that you're on the Johnson Dictionary website, like, you're, you're never going to leave. It's, I think it's permanently <laughs> open in my tabs. Like, That's uh, beautiful. Um, it's amazing. That is not all that he did in those nine years. He is very famous for writing a series of essays called The Rambi, which are on moral, political, literary, religious, like any number of topics. It's a, it's a sort of higher version of self-help. He wrote those essays at the same time that he wrote the diction. Which is another, like, startling level. When he finished the dictionary, he did another series of essays. Then he did something called Rasselas, which is a short novella that... I mean, so many people in history have said there is more wisdom in that book than in any other. He also wrote a poem called The Vanity of Human Wishes. And this is all in this 10 or 15 year period. Um, a remarkable achievement. He then has a sort, of, a sort of fallow period, sort of three years where he seems to do nothing other than learn and get drunk. Quite literally, we don't really know what he lived off really. And then he comes back and retires you know, when he's sort of in his 60s and writes The Lives of the Poets, which is one of the most innovative uh, works of literary criticism and biography in the history of literature. And full of many, many wonderful passages of writing, so quotable, so, so, such a high achievement. Uh, and these are just the major works. You can then get into all the volume after volume reviews and then other you know sermons legal opinions he would write anything for any uh, so a bit like mill he has this sort of incredible breadth piled on top of really remarkable productivity do you think the uh things like the rambler do you think the the modern newsletter is sort of our uh yeah. modern version of those is that exactly. how you think of think about yours it went out twice a week. He got a subscription. Uh, he, he, he would try and, you know, he wanted them when they were really good, they'd be picked up by like regional newspapers and reprinted and he'd make a lot of that. So it's a very, very similar thing. And a similar thing, I think, as well in the writing practice, because he would often sit down while the boy from the printer was standing in the door saying, you know, I've been sent to get the copy. And he's going, five more minutes. I've got to finish writing it. <laughs> five more minutes. Um, 
So it's it's got many parallels to the modern Substack, right? <laughs> Working to a deadline. Yeah. What what is a common reader? The common reader is a phrase from Samuel Johnson. He was criticizing a poet called Thomas Gray, who had lots of like fancy language and old-fashioned words. And Johnson was saying, "Oh, this is all unreadable. Yeah, it's, it's all just rubbish." And then there's a famous poem called "An Elegy in the Country Churchyard," which you, I say famous. It used to be the sort of poem that every child at school in England, then obviously no longer. But when he comes to that poem, Johnson says, I rejoice to concur with the common reader. You know, this is a great poem. And it is only from the common reader that the final sort of sets of honours can be bestowed. And what he means is, Johnson's very up on the idea of living in a commercial society. This is like the mid to late 18th century. So he can really see that like capitalism's here, commerce is here, society's completely changed. And he's saying, look, people buy books Right, there's a market. And this is the big thing. This is the force that decides who survives and who doesn't. Like, yes, we have critics and scholars and, you know, he's on the side of those people. But he's also saying, look, I'm, I'm writing off Grey. He's, he's pompous and purple and no good. But come on, everyone loves this poem and they're right to. And that's why. At, and it's true. He's still, you know, he still survives now for that poem. So the common reader is the, the non-professional reader who wants to read the great works and who wants to like educate themselves in a way. And I think if you go on Twitter, it's that's everywhere, right? Common reader yeah. is a big force in modern culture. Well, you see people sort of uh, try to dunk on writers that are popular, right? It's like, oh, not Atomic Habits or Malcolm Gladwell's writing, but it's like, yeah, people, people love that stuff. There's nothing wrong with it. I, in fact, like, Gladwell's writing was sort of a portal to the deeper stuff for me. I think I think Gladwell particularly is a good example of someone who gets criticized for like whether he is right, whereas the achievement is that he spread those ideas so wide. You wouldn't be talking about whether he's right. You wouldn't be talking about all these theories, all this social science. Right. Like, he got that out there. That's really important. Um, what's changed since... Johnson's time is that, you know, as Johnson said, men require more often to be reminded than informed. He was trying to get back to like ancient wisdom, religious wisdom, like we know all. We live in an age where there's a lot of new wisdom. And so Gladwell, like inevitably will be, you can look at a book like The Tipping Point or Outliers that are relatively old now. Okay, the, the research has moved on. The particulars of the, you know, the numbers are no longer correct, whatever. But there's still a similarity in the in the like the ability to show people. I think this is what's going on based on this research, and it's a very high achievement. I've written about him more once on my Substack because I um I think he's very very interesting, and you have to take that seriously. Right? How did you think about building a life around writing? It seemed pretty. It seemed like it was clear to you early that you wanted to do this, and. It seems you majored in biography, which I've I've never seen as a major before. Um, so I imagine if you're picking something like biography, you are certainly intending to build a life around the written word. So to begin with, I I did a degree in English literature, and then I went back and did a, an MA in biography ah. a few years. Ago. But it's just a very similar thing. Right. I just did that. I just did that because I was interested. Uh, I didn't really, I didn't feel like quit my job and become a writer until I was like 35. So, and I still do a lot of freelance marketing work. I'm not, I'm not one of these pure writers by any means. Uh, and I think, I, I don't think you have to be. Um, so I didn't really build my life around writing. It, it happened a bit later. And I didn't yeah, think it through th- at all. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, how do you think about that balance between writing and other things? I mean, I, I de- like writing for me is the most important sort of work I do. I love it. It's something I can't really not do, but I still do some consulting work and stuff. And I've never tried to solve that 
as sort of like, oh, I need to be completely a writer. And I almost wonder if there's some advantage to not having the pressure from writing. Did you have certain models about how you were thinking about it early on? I really didn't. It's it's really a case of like early money. Yeah. And as you say, I'm, I'm, I'm always going to write like around whatever it is I'm doing. Uh, so that it doesn't go away when you're consulting. Uh, and particularly the reading, right? I, I always think that, but at what half of all writing is reading, if not, if not a much bigger number, uh, that's always there. And I just, I think it's a very pragmatic thing. Do you see yourself as a late bloomer? Uh, uh, maybe that depends on how successful the book is. <laughs> 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 I don't know. It, it would be presumptuous for me to say that I've bloomed, I think. Fair. Yeah. Um, well, how do you, yeah. How do you think about like success as a writer and what's your relationship with those things? Success means having an audience and it means, um, it means people taking you serious. There's obviously a sort of an element of money and an element of, um, being published in, you know, notable places, but I think in in all ages, what success as a writer has meant is people will be good. Good, and how, not just like but you need good readers who you are really sort of vested in it, respond to it, share it, and readers who are also writers. I think all of these things are significant. Yeah, the the way I think about it is, who are the people I can attract with my writing that I actually want to spend time with? because it's, it sort of leads to this virtuous mm-hmm. cycle of actually deepening my ideas. And I just love people that like yeah. to think deeply around these ideas. There's a lot of um, correspondence between writing and conversation. And again, that's very true historically, right? Yeah. What, uh, what led to you uh, thinking about this book idea? So I think your subtitle is what late bloomers can tell you about success and reinventing your life, which is very interesting to me because I'm just deeply curious about how do you reinvent your life? Um, yeah. How did, how did the idea bubble up for you? The sort of marketing work that I do is employment marketing. So I, I do research about organizational culture, what it is that makes a company attractive to go work at. And because I was the research and, and branding person, this meant I would always get questions from clients about the labor market, right? And when you're in a tight market, everybody wants to know, oh my God, where can we get people? Right? We've run out of people. Where do they all go? <laughs> um, and I, so you keep doing, you know, getting these inquiries and doing research and, and sending back, you know, slides or whatever. And I kept coming back to this like cluster of ideas around um, basically that said that we're not as good as we think at identifying talent. So a lot of things have changed in the recruitment in recent years to do with uh, whether you need a particular sort of degree to be eligible to go on the, you know, go on the law club graduate scheme, whether you need to have gone to a particular sort of university, right? Is it even valuable to have a degree? Can we not just take school leavers and train them? Or like there are so many questions. There's women coming back into the workforce when they've been out of work for three, four plus years. Have they like lost their skills? Or actually, is it just a question of redesigning the, the entry point and giving them some confidence? And, and that, guess what? They come back and they do a great job. Um, people doing career changes in their 50s and becoming the intern again, right? When they're When they're like, they've been in senior management and so just in so many ways there was this this cluster of ideas that i was researching that said actually a lot of the things that we sort of took for granted as markers of talent and how we assess talent they just weren't really true right all the all the big law firms you have to have a two-one from a top five university that's all gone that that's all gone and it hasn't really made any difference to anything turns out you can assess for talent across 50 different universities without looking at the degree outcome. It still works, right? And so there were all those sorts of ideas 
in my head. And then I was ill and I had to take a few months off work. And I reread the work of Penelope Fitzgerald, who is, I think, a wonderful novelist, a genius of the late 20th century, very underrated. You must all read her books. Um, but she didn't start writing until she was 60. Yeah. So this again for me, I was like, look, you see, here we go. This is what I'm saying. Like, no one knows. No, no one knew she was going to be a novelist. It's the same thing. I'm starting with, you know, it's one of those things that starts to like bug you. And then I heard a podcast with Tyler Cowen where he said something like, of people who haven't done anything yet, but maybe they will. And I was like, yes, it's the maybe. And maybe, there's no room for maybe in this discussion. And then it kind of came together in my head. That that's a thing. And so I started blogging about it. Obviously, at that point, my clients were like, what are you talking about? We're not going to hire a 60-year-old <laughs> novelist. Well, tell him to stop. <laughs> but, um, but like, it, I started blogging. And then, you know, you start seeing it everywhere. You start researching it. And suddenly, it's like, I realized, like, late dreamers are a whole category of talent that just haven't been considered properly yet. I, don't, I didn't think. One, getting enough attention in the workplace, even though they're a very real thing. And I hope a lot of people listening to this will be thinking, that's true. I know people who have like taken very new directions in their career at a point when you wouldn't expect it. And I think if you're inside a company, that's much easier than if you're trying to get hired in to do that new direction. And it's really interesting to me that so often the criteria on a job ad are like quite strict. But if the company is like in a pinch and needs to get the work done, we have someone over here. She's pretty good. Why don't we just give it to her? And you're like, what's the, what's the explanation for like putting the barrier up? And the explanation is you can assess the person you've already got and you kind of, yeah, yeah, she probably will. That's fine. Great. The new person, it's almost impossible to. And so yeah, that's why I got interested. It's almost like we, and I explore this a bit and just thinking through like, what is the default path? But I think, the way I've been thinking about it is we sort of just embrace these stories and scripts of this very simple life path. And all we're doing is taking the markets, um, like what the market is saying for our own reality. The problem with that is it totally undermines or uh, eliminates any space for human transformation and change, right? It's like, this is a career path that is the reality of a human life. And there's actually some interesting research from Donald Super in the 1950s. And it was talking about life development stages. Yeah. And it's really funny. I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, but basically it was like, all right, 17 to 22 is your searching phase. And that's what he called it is like, you're searching for your thing. And then for the next 20 years, you're doing the thing. Yeah. And then somewhere in your late forties or early 50 is just the decline. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's so crazy to read this because you realize it's basically just like a company's career track. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the hum any sort of human potential or the reality of human lives. Yeah. Um, and we're a couple generations removed from that, and we don't even question this anymore. Like we, I've talked to people in their their sixties, and they're like, "I'm not creative. Like I'm done. I can't work anymore." It's like, <laughs> and so I, I love what you're doing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about Penelope Fitzgerald? She was born into a very uh, sort of upper middle class or upper class English family. Just in the middle of the First World War, both of her grandfathers were bishops, and her father edited Punch, which was a, a very dominant uh, Victorian magazine. So she's really born into the establishment. Um, they're enlightened about women in her family. Her mother's been to Oxford. I, yeah. So she goes to her mother's college. And obviously, expectations are high, right? We're surrounded by bishops, and, and all of her uncles are famous. You know, Ronald Knox, famous detective story writer. One of them's a spy. Uh, one of them, you know, writes, writes books. Like, she's surrounded by all this accomplishment. She leaves Oxford. 
Um, she lives this sort of bougie life in London. She gets married to an officer in the army. This is the time of the Second World War. And then he comes back from the war with PTSD. And life becomes really difficult. And there's this weird period where she kind of could be writing, but she isn't writing. And she's doing some reviews and stuff, but there's no, we can't really see any fiction going on. It's difficult to know because she lost some of her papers. But she's doing like creative things. She's going to pottery classes mm-hmm. and stuff. But her husband's problems get worse and worse. He, he starts drinking. They have to leave London to escape their creditors. They go to the coast and they live in this very unfortunate way. She's working in a bookshop. And then they come back to London because presumably the, you know, the money problem is over. But they can't afford rent, so they live on a boat. And after a while, the boat sinks and they're not homeless. And eventually they get council accommodation and she's working as a teacher and they can sort of you know, they, they get it together. And as a teacher, she's working in a sort of, it, it's like a grammar college. So like mostly girls from well-to-do families going for like Oxford and Cambridge, intense Jewish like classes to, to, to get them into Oxford and Cambridge, prepare them for those exams. And so to do this, she's rereading the classic works and she's paying very close attention to them. And she makes masses of notes about how exactly is it that Jane Austen's novels work? What is going on in George Eliot? What's Samuel Beckett doing to get this effect? She's really, really going into that. She's reading critical works. And her whole life, she's also studying languages, like German, Russian, traveling, going to the opera. And so there's a sense in which the two things in her life are this like personal catastrophe, plus really deep learning. She just goes through the whole tradition again so then when she's 60 her husband dies she's like she's got lots of time on her hands all of that can come together and she becomes a novelist of basically of experience she can write from the experience of her own life but she's also done all this deep learning and so she does two sorts of books the bookshop she worked in becomes a novel the boat becomes a novel the school becomes a novel right and then there are these four great novels at the end or historical fiction set in Germany, uh, Russia, Italy, and India, all based on her traveling languages, right? And so they are just, they're some of really the best historical fiction. And what critics at the time said was, how does she make it so Russian? <laughs> I don't understand how, because she's so immersed in the language and the history and the culture and the, right, she's been doing it for decades. And they're so short, these books. They're really, they're really like 50,000 words max. That's almost like an event. That she can, every word is exactly the right word to make it. Like the one, uh, the blue flower said in Prussia in the 18th century. It sounds ridiculous, but the critic who said, how did she make it so German? I mean, that is the right question to ask. It's, it's really incredible. No one who reads that book ever forgets it. She wrote it, I think, when she was 18. And so she's beautiful. It's really beautiful. And so she became a novelist of experience, right? Everything that happened to her, she was able to. And also, I should say, a novelist of nostalgia. She, you know, she's, by the time she's writing in the 70s and 80s, she's looking back to the pre Second World War, like that Edwardian generation that had brought her up. And that comes out a lot as well, that kind of lost ethos. Um, and so rather than being like a lost talent who was crushed in her youth, I really came to think of her as someone who, like, the way she works as an artist is through, like, massive immersion, like, massive input, amazing levels of knowledge and scholarship, huge personal experiences, and just is able to synthesize all of that in a way that no, no 30-year-old, like, that's not possible to do that year ago. Um, so the nature of her art is, it is late. It's late on. It's unrivaled, I think. That's amazing. It it's wild to think about this because the more you think about just potential and go throughout history, you realize, wow, there were probably so many people that yeah. either could share. I mean, it was really hard for women to share for a very long time, and 
um, now it is so much easier to share ideas. And I imagine some people would come back uh, from a couple hundred years ago and be like, how are you creatively stuck? You can publish your stuff for free on the internet. What are you doing? Put your stuff out there. <laughs> this is something I think about. And it's like, do people know that like people used to die for the right to share their work? <laughs> I, I don't know how to think about this because, so I totally agree with you. And I, and I think it's this amazing thing. And it, it, um, it's, it's, but it's also like, is it too easy? When, when there's a yeah. barrier, like that is part of how you impose standards on people right? and how people like have something that they have to like work towards. And, and that also, that barrier helps to impose the pressure of the pulse. Like the people who came before me were so good. They need to be so good. Whereas I wonder if the internet has like this dual thing with the benefit of being able to publish and explore and discover but also the difficulty of like slightly removing burden. And the burden is part of what pushes you to achieve things. I don't know, but I, I wonder about that. Thing. Yeah, my gut is that it's probably moved the median to the right. Like there's been a net improvement, but there's long tails. <laughs> oh yeah. Especially, especially on the left side. And uh, yeah, you're probably right. I think there's probably some otherwise more deeper contemplative thinkers that satiate enough of their creative urge with like a tweet or something. Um, I think I waited too long to actually write a book. And one of my reflections was that, wow, this really pushed me to grow and go deeper. And so these deeper forms really are powerful. I think so. And I think, um, I think you see this in literature in like in modern fiction and stuff. Twitter is great and it expands the reach and it, and it gives writers a new platform. But there is a risk that you become really good at Twitter instead of really good at writing a novel. And I think that has happened to some people. And I think, it, I think we should have it and we should explore it and we should have Twitter in fiction and, and keep going with that. But it's also like, how many great tweets do you want to write versus like a novel? <laughs> right? Yeah. And I'd love to ask you about a couple things in the book. I think one yeah. thing, um, one thing that really jumped out to me and something I've been thinking a lot about is you, you write many late bloomers lack the cultural meal. I don't know how to say it. Milieu? Milieu. Milieu. Yeah. Milieu. There we go. <laughs> Tongue tied this morning. Um, that is essential to success. And I think this is something I've been exploring a lot recently. I was reading the story of Robert Caro. He walks into the New York Public Library and he doesn't talk to anyone for a couple of days. He's super embarrassed. He doesn't want anyone to ask him how long he's been um, writing his book. Then somebody asks, uh, he says five years and they go, oh, cool. I've been working on mine for nine or something <laughs> like that. And he writes at this moment was like such a relief. He had finally found his people. And uh, yeah, that line really stuck out to me when you were writing this. Um, what are some other examples of this you've seen? There are several people in the book. I think um, sometimes people are shy. Sometimes they don't know how. Sometimes they're in the wrong place. Sometimes like, you know, women aren't allowed in the club, like there are prejudices. There are so many reasons. Uh, but there's a whole chapter with, with people who, like Nathaniel Hawthorne, the great American novelist, I think Henry James said, you know, he's brilliant. He's done so much, but it's a real shame because if he'd only shown someone his writing and, and, and been with other writers, you know, he wouldn't have had to spend 15 years sitting in a room on his own trying to work it all out. <laughs> um, and I think again and again, you see, so one, one of the sort of theories I put forward is that late bloomers begin in a, an, an exploration stage where they're doing lots of different, so a bit like Penelope Fitzgerald with all her reading and learning, and like, sort of looking around the world. And at some point they choose to switch and go into exploit. 
and, and it's just, you know, get the work done, as it were. This is based on a paper by uh, Northwestern, I think it is, out of Kellogg. And um, a lot of times it's the network, it's finding your, your group that is the thing that helps you switch. And a lot of times that's coincidental, right? It's very difficult to force that. Um, and it's very difficult to, like, contrive it. And I think I, I can't prove, I didn't put it in these, like, terms in the book, because, like, how can you prove it? But I think there's some, there must be something about the personality of people who do later that, like, this is not what they're good at, right? This, this is something that they have to find their way with. Yeah, and like Hawthorne is a good example. I think he stumbled upon the the like group in Concord right. in Massachusetts. There's a great book about this called uh, American Bloomsbury, and it it talks about like Hawthorne, Melville, uh, Marie Louise Alcott, um, yeah. and um, of course Emerson and um, Thoreau. They're all like on one street. <laughs> <laughs> they're like walking back and forth to people's houses. They're like all sorts of these cross relationships and they're all just working on their writing. Yeah. And it, it makes you realize like how powerful that can be. And that that's something I've been trying to do. I, I was actually co-writing with a friend this morning and um, trying to talk about like, how do we get more of this yeah. together? I have a and, friend, and I, he lives close by, and we've known each other since school. And I, this whole book is the product of me just chatting to him. Yeah, it's, it's really. Yeah, how does the power of conversation shape your writing? Well, I mean, I think partly it, it, it you just the more you babble on about something, you overhear yourself and think, "Oh, now it makes sense," <laughs> right? Because you're forced to explain it to yourself in a way. Um, I think it's Charlie Munger. He talked about, um, you know, the, the Warren Buffett's partner. He talked about how he has this thing, like if you, if you um, go into a room where there's an orangutan and you have to explain your idea to the orangutan, like after 10 minutes, you come out much wiser than when you went in. Um, I think that's a really good observation. And it's like, it's also an argument for talking to yourself. Which again, I think a lot of people find like I don't want to talk to myself. But there's only so much that your friends, your spouse like, are going to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I I I actually read my own words out loud as I'm right. typing, and this was something I've been thinking about recently. And I realized conversations really shape everything I do with writing. I'm sort of like talking it out to myself. How does this sound over and over and over and over again? And it, uh, it is a very powerful thing. It writing is this mysterious thing that there's no right formula. You basically just have to like try stuff and treat it as this very sacred process. I think also like, you you it's as you're writing that you realize what you think right and it's it's the act of like moving the pencil hitting the keys that is the thing you don't have it all worked out in your head first and i think the same is true of conversation like in a way the more self-conscious you are about trying to think up something to say the less successful it is whereas if you just talk the you know the words come out and you think oh great actually that sounded pretty good Everyone's had that in a work meeting, right? Where they say something and then they think, I have got to write that down because like, if I need to say that again to someone, I'm going to forget. And so there's a shared thing where they're, they're both quite generative processes. I loved you pointed out in another one of your chapters was the power of uh, being disappointed early. Like, I think that there is a quote in my first book by David Foster Wallace. He's like, the great one of the greatest privileges in life is succeeding as early as possible. So, you know, it's not all worth it. Um, <laughs> and it, <laughs> said with a little more, uh, David Foster Wallace energy, but, um, sure. I think that was something I experienced too, which was, okay, I'm in my early thirties. I'm where I thought I wanted to be. This is 
kind of disappointing. <laughs> so what, um, is that a theme you've seen in a lot of late bloomers? I have a whole chapter on midlife crisis and on the idea that uh, you, you will reach a point in your life where um, you're dissatisfied with the overall mix. Right? And there are different theories. Some people think this is biological occurrence and it happens to the great apes and it's like it's just hormones it's just chemistry like you know don't take it too seriously i think that the data on that are like less certain and that the idea of the happiness you bend um is i don't know i think i think it, that used to look really convincing and some of the data now looks much less convincing and there's an argument to be said that like that you bend is very different across different countries, right? It's very different depending on the um, statistical techniques that you use to interrogate the data. It, um, and it doesn't take very much account of the individual variation. In it. So I sort of ended up saying, like, for some people, a midlife crisis is a great opportunity. And they should, they should have a midlife crisis. They should, they should like, change things. I don't like giving advice because I feel like, as I was saying about the happiness curve, right? Like it's these big statements that don't apply to everyone and you don't want people to like take something from that that's bad for them. But there's, there's definitely something about like the necessity to change because whether you've succeeded or whether you haven't is no real guarantee of what's going to happen to you later, right? Just because you haven't made it yet. Like, I don't think that's a bit as strong an indicator as we think. Um, and letting it, letting it be an indicator is a, like, that's a conscious end. I haven't made it. It's not going to happen. That attitude in itself is like, that's not just an analysis of where you are. That's creating a situation. Again, I don't want to tell everyone, like, don't give up. Hey, everyone's going to get there and the prizes for all. Like, no, of course not. But I think it's important to keep that in mind. And I couple, there's some other research in the book about um, what's called a competency trip. So the other side of this is like, you can get really good at something, right? You're in your mid thirties, your forties, you, you become like an expert, you become a senior person at work. You really know what you're doing. The idea at that point of going back to scratch with something, just makes you think, oh God, I remember what it was like to be 23 and I didn't know and yeah. I had to make mistakes. And, oh, it's just or I'm not going to do that. That could be a really bad idea. <laughs> like the fact that it would be like uncomfortable and difficult and like you'd have to be look like an idiot. Okay, but you don't know that like you might not be great at that thing or that you might not just really enjoy it and that looking like an idiot is fine because it will be really fun and reward, right? Like, you'll get a lot of value out of it. And so there are these two sides where, like, some, you shouldn't be trapped by your own competence. And you also shouldn't be trapped by the sense that, like, oh, I'm 40, I'm in a slump, whatever. Like, don't accept that there are definitive things about either of those. It's an individual assessment. It depends so much on the situation you're in and who you are. Um, I've almost, I've almost, like been radicalized against averages because I, <laughs> I worry that they they don't tell you the, the variation they don't tell you like how, how certain they are and that it just looks a bit like that's the way it is for people and it isn't yeah yeah i was reading this research that said uh you're on our av- of course on average people's views at 19 predicted their views on money at like 30 years later and it's like, well, like, I know for a fact my views on money radically changed. <laughs> and so what other, like, conventional wisdom should I be skeptical of? Yeah. Probably, like, a lot of it, right? It's, it's these self-fulfilling prophecies. But um, there there's, is no actual average person. <laughs> so there's a really interesting psychologist called Jay Belsky. And he has some work that says that um, your propensity to be affected by um, like trauma, 
basically varies quite a lot. So some people, if they have a really difficult time with their parents as children, it like won't really affect them at all. And some people, it'll affect them very strongly. This will then change when you're teenagers. Different people will be affected by it. And he has, the numbers are in the book. It's actually really fascinating the extent to which there is lots of variation in how the same bad, you know, going through the same bad experience affects different people. For some people, it just like, it's not a big deal. But if it happens to them at a different stage in their life, it really is a big deal, right? Um, and I think something like that, like we need a, a slightly different attitude on these things. Like what, I always want to know what is the variation. The chapter on cognitive decline in this book pushes this point that like, yes, there is average cognitive decline. Like, look, you'd have to be an idiot to deny that there's a cognitive decline as we age, right? Yeah, of course. But these numbers are given. This, there's, there's a book about this and a, and a, a piece in the Atlantic about this saying, like, you reach a certain age and it goes downhill and you really need to rethink your life and stuff. And it doesn't talk about the variation, but the variation on these particular numbers is huge. And there are really good studies, the Moray House test study, where they gave the same people the same IQ test, I think at age 17 and age 70. Some gaps, a big gap like that, right? Loads of people got a higher score. Loads of people got a lower score. Loads of people came in about the same. And that graph that just shows cognitive ability going down on an average curve, it doesn't tell you that crucial bit of information it which is a lot of people this isn't true <laughs> like a lot and and that's what i worry about is is the idea that like like we used to have this thing where people would say oh growth mindset is real and then people started saying what's the effect size and and the answer was well it's quite small it doesn't really make a lot of difference i think we now need a phase where people say okay but what's the variation like <laughs> right how many people is this really, really true for? Because we're giving this advice, and I don't think we know. Yeah. It's like how most stuff is. I feel like the deeper you go into anything, it's like, well, ultimately, we don't know. <laughs> we have a pretty good idea. And as I say, that like, cognitive decline is real. But Oh, yeah, for sure. I was just fascinated that like, really quite a lot of people seem to be higher scoring in all the well, this is the idea of there is no actual average person, right? Because we're so multifaceted. We have thousands of things that describe us, right? So we're going to be like inevitably somebody is going to be good at something at an older age. Yeah. And um, it's sort of just this acknowledgement that, yeah, there is beauty in all of us. I may not be able to be a sophisticated researcher and nonfiction writer when I'm older, but I don't know. Maybe I'll be good at speaking and mentoring and conveying different energy to different people. And we'll have to find out. We'll have to reconnect in um, 40 years for another podcast and see how we aged. You can tell me how you became a late bloomer. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, how did this book change you? <laughs> I know uh, books always change people in the process of writing it, don't you think? I don't know. I don't think of myself like that. Um, I think a lot of the ideas that I've expressed in this conversation would have been quite alien to me before I'd written the book. So I think it probably changed me, changed what I thought. I don't know. I, I I don't know if I'm self-reflective enough to give like a good answer to that question. That's that's a, yeah, and it's still to be published. So I I found that it was after publishing and actually talking to many people about my book that really mm -hmm. sort of helped me think about it in new ways and apply it to my life even more. What kind of things? What? How did it change you? So I think it's. I mean, when you're writing you're sort of, it's such a personal act, right? And you're exploring these ideas and you then put them out in, into the world and random people start telling you what different things meant to them. And 
um, asking you deeper questions about what you've already written and realizing. Um, and then just noticing, I think actually publishing and putting my book out was the first time I was really like, okay, I am a person who writes and shares ideas. Now, I am not strongly identified with that. I don't care about the identity of being an author or anything like that. But it's like, yeah, this this is like a chapter of my life. And I am not afraid to be seen as a writer. I, I didn't really grow up in like a scholarly background. So it was like, yeah, I'm I'm doing this. So I'm going to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I don't even know. It's hard to think about. But yeah. I think. I have I have a lot about that in the book as well. The way that you people change very incrementally, and you look back after ten years and say, "Oh, look, this person became a late bloomer by doing all this stuff," and it took them a long time. And, and they like they can say, "Like, oh, I've become I've become a writer and I put my ideas in public." You would never have anticipated this, but there's equally no moment where like it changed that day. And I. I think that's quite important for, for like you talked earlier about like transforming your life. I think it happens. I think it happens like through sampling and, and through in, incremental changes. What role did uh, Tyler Cowen have in helping you uh, do this project? No Tyler Cowen, no book. Uh, a very important role. He gave me a grant from Emerging Ventures, um, so that I could just quit my job and write it um, and Tyler is very um, very supportive you can email him ask him things send him things to read like he, he was very good on all of that um, but yeah I mean no, no Tyler no book for sure yeah I love his um, quote he said it in a number of different places but it's like one of the most important things you can do is raise the ambitions of other people and I think being on a creative journey, I've realized how rare that is and how special there are people like Tyler doing that for other people. And it's really something I'm trying to embrace too, is like part of why I do this podcast is like, I just get excited about what people are doing. Like I'm re I love your writing so much. Thank like I, I want more people to read it. And it's like, I get so excited about that. Um, I'm very pleased and to yeah, it. It's so powerful. Uh, it sort of goes to what you were saying about the late bloomers and like finding yeah. those people to be around. And it sort of does like happen by accident. It's kind of crazy. It happens by accident. And this is where the internet is wonderful. It, the internet just creates so many accidents for you. And it gives you a way of, like I can just email Tyler Count. I shouldn't say that because, like, to, you yeah. know, loads of people will email him. Um, but like, the fact that you can just email no, he people, he responds to everyone. <laughs> I've but, emailed him too. But you know what I mean? Like, you can just you can be nobody. You can be online reading, you know, looking things up. Email someone who's interesting. Like, this is an unprecedented level. And yeah, sure, a lot of them don't reply, but. You know, I, I was working on the gender pay gap a few years ago in my job. Um, and I emailed Claudia Golden, the Harvard economist. I had two, like, snickety questions. And she got back to me that afternoon and was like, yes, but you've forgotten this point and, and look at this paper. It was, uh, you know, it's incredible that you can do that. And I think it's under, still underrated. Like, email is still underrated. Yeah. What do you think Samuel Johnson would be working on today? It's an interesting question because he was fascinated most by biography. And biography had a boom in the 20th century. There were the Michael Holroyd generation. Uh, these big, vivid, well-researched biographies and this whole generation of people going back and actually writing about figures from history who were gay, actually taking seriously the women of history, right? This whole, we had, we had a great boom of biography. Um, I don't know if we still have that. And I don't know, I think AI is a very interesting challenge to the biographer. 
Um, but the major difference is that these biographies are all huge, where the modern biography is like a thousand pages and sort of intimidatingly long. Whereas Johnson wrote, a very, I mean, what we would think of as one chapter maybe would be his whole biography. So he had the, the really the art of concision. And I think that will become much more important in the age of AI, right? You versus chat GPT, probably you shouldn't write a thousand pages. Um, and Johnson would have been really good at that. He was, he was absolutely brilliant at uh, short writing. So I think he'd be thriving. I think he'd be doing really well. And he'd put the Rambler on Substack. And he'd, he'd be great. <laughs> I'm sure somebody has uh, the Rambler as a name. If they don't, I'd be surprised. But um, yeah, that that's beautiful. Any other uh, like for people on like I write for a lot of people that are sort of carving their own path. Some people still doing gigs on the side. Some people still trying to find their thing. Some people finding their thing and trying to build a life around that. What are some of the lessons from the the late bloomers you think somebody in the modern world should embrace? My favorite, I think my favorite late bloomer is Audrey Sutherland, who was a kayaker. She ought to be famous. Uh, she is famous among kayakers. She ought to be famous among everybody. She, uh, she went in an inflatable kayak to explore the coast of British Columbia and Alaska throughout her 60s and 70s and into her 80s. She'd never kayaked in, in cold waters before. She was doing this on her own. She had bear encounters. Like it was, it was really fantastic and her memoirs about it are so worth reading. And she was a single mother. She, like, she had a job, but she wasn't like, you know, well off. She had four kids and uh, she only started really doing these kind of coastal explorations and kayaking in her 40s. She'd been a very competent swimmer before that, but she really developed throughout her life. And she used to give talks. And yeah. at the end, you know, kayaking talks, right, about how to, how to do particular things. But at the end, she would say, close your eyes. Someone's going to give you $5 million. Okay. Think about what is it you're going to do? with your life now that you have the five minutes. This is like back in the 90s. So whatever the number is, to, I don't know the number, but like, what are you going to do? Billion. <laughs> yeah, but like, you know. I'm just kidding. It's like I think five million would still do I, it. Five million is still pretty good, yeah. I would um, do stuff for far less. <laughs> but, then, but then she says, okay, so open your eyes and tell me, like, why can't you just do it now? Right? And one time this, this, you know, grumpy man stood up and said, I'll tell you why I can't do it. <laughs> I, have, <laughs> I have a wife, I have children, I have bills to pay, my parents are elderly, I've got a mortgage, right? All, all the usual stuff. Yeah. Uh, but of course, he's saying this to Audrey Sutherland, who's a single mother with four kids, and, uh, you know, she knows much better than him, like these problems. And she said, okay, you have to find something that you can do today. You have to just, where can I start right now? And she was always, like, if she saw good rope that someone had discarded on the side of the road, she would take it. Anything like that, she would take it, repair it, make use of it. She would study maps. She would go to the sea near her house and practice capsizing and bringing it. Anything, anything you can do, you just constantly, these marginal gains. Uh, to the extent that her table, her, her dining table, was glass-topped and under the glass were the maps of British Columbia and Alaska. So she's always just trying to make these incremental gains. And that's how she ends up doing what she does. And I, you see this in several of the case studies, and I think it's really the most important advice. It's not a question of how do I quit my job today and do my dream. It's a question of it, a, a torrent is made of drops, right? And you've got to keep going with anything you can do right now. I love that example so much. It resonates with my story. I think one thing I've tried to pull out in this podcast is I think the I quit um, in a bold moment of courage is sort of a fake story because, it, and I think 
why it gets told is people expect that story and they yeah. think they're supposed to tell that story. But I'll always say like, what is something that happened three to four years before you quit or five years or 10 years? There's always something. Yeah. <laughs> There's always these small moments and you don't see it looking forward, but you do see it looking back. Um, and I think knowing that sort of with what your book is saying too can give people confidence that it isn't these bold moments of courage. It's these small moments of just sort of following your curiosity and also adopting the idea that it's not over. Like you're, you're not, yeah. your current path is not your final path. Um, but so I go back to yeah. Anna P. Fitzgerald where we started. She publishes this, her first novel when she's 60, but she's had years of the houseboat and homelessness and all these difficulties. And what is she doing? She's teaching herself German. She's reading great literature. She's going to the opera. Like she's building it up day by day, right? That's exactly as you say. If there is this one moment, it comes at the end of a lot of preparation, the climatization, like accruing what you need to do it. Do you have any path role models? What do you mean? Yourself, like, do you look at Samuel Johnson as like I, I sort of want to craft a life similar to his? I don't know about a. I don't think his life, his life wasn't very enviable, but no, I know in terms of like how to live, not in that way, but like people like Samuel Johnson, are sort of role models in the sense of he was so dedicated to learning and to wisdom and to his work. Um, yeah, I do. I, I do think of him like that. Beautiful. Where where can people uh, follow you to learn more? And uh, please talk about uh, the book and when the book's going to be out. The book is out in May in the UK, September in the US. It's called Second Act. What Lake Bloomers can teach you about success and reinventing your life. Pre-order it now so that you get it as soon as possible. Get more than one copy. Give it to the late bloomer that you know, right? Um, my Substack, The Common Reader, is where you can follow me. I'm on Twitter, but I'm not good at Twitter. Much better on Substack. Beautiful. Well, really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I have a lot of ideas flowing now, so need to sit down and take some notes. But appreciate your curiosity inspired by your work, and thank you for sharing this book with the world. Thank you, Paul. I'm really glad to be here. This was a great conversation. Hey there, thanks for watching that episode of the Pathless Path podcast in video form on YouTube. If you want to see more episodes, you can find links to further episodes up here, or you can subscribe over here. Thank you for your support, and I wish you luck on your own Pathless Path.